And now in the proclamation of the word, we come to the Lord and ask him to speak to us from his word. And today we are um, in the last message in our series in Philippians, Put It Into Practice. And today we're going to be talking about Put It Into Practice, Give. He ends the letter that he has penned in prison to the church at Philippi by talking about their giving and what a blessing it had been in his praise report to them and explanation of how their giving uh, was connected with the spreading of the gospel. And there is so much for us to learn from this particular text about giving. And I want us to take it in, every bit of it. This is Paul's praise to the Philippians. He's praising them. In fact, it's like a thank you note. Thank you for your faithfulness and giving. It's a validation of their eternal investment that the giving they gave was worth it all for eternity. It was an explanation of giving, as he put it, that pleases God. Now that gets my attention. I I want to do the things that please God. And, And if giving is done correctly, it pleases God. Uh, Now, Ben read 10 through 20 for our text today, and some of that we've already covered, but really I want to um, look at verse 10, and then we'll look at 14 through 20. And uh, I'm including 10, even though we've already talked about it, because it talks about their giving. It's connected. Uh, We need to understand 10 in order to grasp 14 through 20. If if you can look at the text, I want to just note some key Words, if you'll underline them in your Bible or in your notes, uh, so that they will uh, be prominent to you, so that you can think about them, that you can write some notes about them as we study the text. The first in verse 10 is he talks about the word, you see the word there, renewed your concern. This is important that they had a renewed concern. That is one of the things we need is a renewed concern in the participation of the spreading of the gospel through our giving. Uh, Secondly, in verse 14, you can come down and see that it says, he says, you shared in my troubles. There's a participatory part of, uh, yes, Epaphroditus would go and serve with him, but there was also a giving of a gift that was given to him. But there was this holistic understanding that the church was functioning as the church in order for Paul to be the missionary that he was. So there was a sharing in the troubles that Paul had. And so then you come down to verse 15, and he talks about the matter of giving and receiving. This is a very interesting thing because, see, the Bible teaches when we give, we receive. The, the world teaches the more you receive, the happier you'll be. The more you get for yourself. But the Bible teaches something totally opposite. That when you give, you receive. And, and so we've got to understand that. This matter of giving and receiving. And then when you come down to 17, he says this. To be credited to your account. He's talking about your spirit spiritual account. He's talking about the account that we will give to God one day in our obedience to God in the area of giving. This is very important to grasp, but he talks about it, to be credited to your account. And then when you come down to 18, he talks about a fragrant offering and an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. Love that. Three things there. Fragrant offering, acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. That's the way it ought to be. And we're going to look at that. But note those, okay? Uh, Very, very important. All of those key things. And then he goes on to say, God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. We're going to ask ourselves the question, do we really believe that at the end? So this is an incredible text on giving. Paul is going to make the point that it's really not about the monetary amount of the gift. It's more about the holistic involvement in the spreading of the gospel. Did you get that? It's not about how much. It's not about who can give the most and who can say, I gave more than you. 
or anything like that. Set that to the side. We'll talk about it. But listen, what he's after here is to praise them, to thank them, to admonish them in the fact that they participated in the holistic practice that brought about the proclamation of the gospel. And that, that, listen, is what pleased God in their giving. And that must be what is key to us as well. In this whole topic of giving and its connection to the spread of the gospel, we come to understand that God calls his people to both give and to go. We're called to both. They are intricately tied together in our hearts. And if we fail to give all to God, which is a picture of surrender, including our finances, including our time, including our gifts, all of that together, if there's not a full surrender, we will not go and spread the gospel as we should. Now, I'm not saying you're not being uh, sharing testimony. I'm not saying that you may not tell somebody to turn their life over to Christ. But I'm talking about the fullness of all that God would want to do in our lives and the full surrender of our time and our talent and, and the things that God has blessed us with so that he can pour through us in such an amazing way. There's the giving and there's the going. Here's an interesting stat I've always found to be interesting. Did you know the Bible talks about baptism? There's 40 verses that deal with that. And we would say baptism is important, and it is. How about prayer? Specifically, there's 275 verses that deal with prayer. And we would say prayer is important. It is. 350 verses that deal with faith, specifically. 650 verses that deal with love. But listen to this. In the Bible, there's recorded 2,350 verses that relate specifically to finances and material possessions. Why? Because, guess what? We are all wrapped up in it. (laughs) You can't get away from it. The clothes you wear, the money you have, the money you earn, how you spend it, how it shapes your life, where it sends you, what you do, the whole deal, we're wrapped up in it. And that's why I think the Bible has so much to say about it. It gives us power. It gives us ability to accomplish things, do things, go places, all of it. And so we have to understand how to handle it correctly from God's point of view. At least we take on the ways of the world. So God says a lot about handling finances and material possessions responsibly. And I want to speak to it from God's Word. I want to be faithful to the text. I want to be faithful to the truths in God's Word and and say what needs to be said for our benefit in our relationship with God and the mission of the church that brings glory to God and all that pleases God. A few weeks ago, I had a message on taking your thoughts captive and and, and just about all the thought life that we have. Remember that message? And I was talking with someone afterwards, and they said, you know, that's that's a pretty intense message. And we were talking about it, and yes, we are responsible for every thought that we have and how we manage those and we deal with those. But the conclusion of the church member who was speaking to me about it, he says, it's good, though. You know why? He said, the Bible says it's there, and we need to deal with it. It's there, and it's real, and we should, we should adhere to it. And, and I agree. Now, that's on the thought life, and that can get very personal. Well, what about the giving life and the resources that we have and what we do with those? That's very personal as well. But guess what? The Bible speaks to it, and we should address it. And to not address it would be irresponsible and not understanding what God has in the very best for our lives and the kingdom work that brings glory to his name. And so today, my heart, my goal is to help us fully understand this so that we live as the Philippians did, so that we can have words of praise from our Father to say, listen, what you're doing, how you're doing it, how you're living, uh, the convictions you have from God's Word, they are, they are pleasing to me. And ultimately, I've, I've, I've kind of cased it in this, these words, we will be When we are fully surrendered, fully giving in every way, we will be a gospel-engaged church. And that's why Paul had so much to say to the Philippians. They were a gospel-engaged church. They weren't just talking about it. They weren't just acknowledging it. They were participating in every way for the gospel to go forward. 
And so today we'll see three things, that they were a sharing church, a sending church, and a sacrificing church. And those three points will help us grasp everything that Paul had to say in conclusion to the church at Philippi, in, in, in Philippi about the beautiful giving that they were participating in. Those three things, a sharing church, a sending church, and a sacrificing church are the three characteristics of a gospel-engaged church. So let's take a look. Point number one. They were a sharing church. This is verses 10, 14 through 17. Paul said, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. See, it was a blessing to him. Indeed, you've been concerned, but you have had no opportunity to show it. Yet it was good for you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, no, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I'm looking for a gift, but I am looking for what may be credited to your account. In these words, in the testimony of how they were engaging and participating in the spread of the gospel, we can say with full confidence they were a sharing church. They were not selfish. They were compassionate and continual givers. Compassionate in that we see in verse 10. He said, you renewed your concern. Uh, they are They are involved. They didn't just say, yeah, we know of Paul. He's out there. No, they had a concern for the work of the Lord and the spreading of the gospel. He says in verse 14 that you shared in my troubles. Shared trouble speaks to the tender and caring heart of the believers at Philippi. They got involved even when it wasn't easy or even when it wasn't pleasant or even when it wasn't just laid out so beautifully that anybody would want to be involved. No, it it involved troubles. It involved spiritual um, attack and spiritual work at hand. But they got involved. They had tender and caring hearts. They weren't uh, scared to do that. They were compassionate givers. But they were also, we can see, they were continual givers, like a perennial flower. In Macedonia, verse 15, um, they were the ones that got involved when nobody else did. And nobody, but they did. In Thessalonica, he said again and again they got involved. And he said in verse 10, now in Rome, they had renewed concern. They're involved once again. So the testimony is it wasn't a one-time gift and Glad you came by, and we're going to share a little bit with you and send you on your way. They stayed connected, they stayed involved, and they gave again, and they gave again, and they gave again, and they were continual givers. And I think one of the most beautiful things about this whole thing is that they, the Philippians, giving was not forced. Paul did not plead with them and beg with them and manipulate them and coerce them and try to, you know, get them involved in some way through some fancy trick or promotion or selling them merch or doing this or doing that. No, they gave. He didn't have to do any of that. They gave convictionally about being a gospel-engaged church, and they wanted to, and they did it again and again and again. It's beautiful. See, to give financially, for me, it is an indicator of obedience to God, and it must If it is going to be a fragrant offering the Bible talks about, it's got to come, listen, from a willing heart. Now we've got to be convinced, convicted that what we are giving, we're giving to God and His work out of obedience to Him. And then the offering is acceptable. Turn with me to Malachi chapter 3. This is a very famous uh, text that deals with giving. And there's much to be learned here. It is in the Old Testament, but the principles at hand about the motive and uh, the type of gift that we give and why we give it is so important, and we learn from it. But this verse has been shared so many times, it's worth reviewing in Malachi 3, 
Look at verses 8 and 9 and following, and it says this. He raises the question. He says, will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, well, uh, well how do we rob you? Oh, I'm not robbing you. <laughs> how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. And he goes on to say, you're under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this way, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will have room enough for it. That is not a formula for uh, financial success in the stock market, God's stock market. <laughs> You're missing the point. And some people preach it that way, like, okay, you give, and God's going to double, triple how much you give. What? That's got nothing to do with it. What it has to do with is the very fact that we have held back from God because we would rather be God in how we manage the resources he's blessed us with instead of trusting God to manage them. And when God manages them, he is going to meet our every need and he exceeds that uh, by meeting our wants as well. This is about trusting God that he owns it all. Tithe is the minimum amount of 10% of income mentioned in Scripture that we are to give. See, the old, this is what some people don't realize. is The Old Testament Jews brought about 23% of their increase to the Lord's storehouse. The storehouse keepers, the Levites, then used what was given to care for widows, needy foreigners um, in the area, orphans, and then, and then themselves. New Testament believers give their tithe and offering to the church, and the church leaders use the money for the spreading of the gospel supporting of the church that builds the church up through the preaching of the word and the caring for the saints, uh, the caring for the poor, the widows, the orphans, and other needy persons. Doesn't it say in Proverbs 3, 9, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first uh, produce of your entire harvest? That's a basic principle. Four things that I wrote down that I wanted to share with you that have been a help to me. They were given to me many years ago, and by faith I took them and I practiced them. And I found that the Lord is true and he is faithful to these things. Here are four truths concerning giving that have helped me. Number one, I had to settle the fact that God owns it all. God owns it all. Everything. God, God owns it all. He owns my life, the breath that I breathe, the air that I breathe, the oxygen that comes in, the blood that flows through my veins, the very fact that I can think, that I can walk, that I can do anything, the blessings of a family, the blessings of an opportunity to work, the blessings of all of it. It all comes from God. He is the, the maker. He is the one who gives life. He is the one who sustains life, and he is the one who takes life. He owns it all, and it is an entrustment. I came to the conclusion that whatever I have, God has entrusted to me. And yes, I am more than willing to give 10% of anything that he has given to me. But the other thing that I had to really come to grips with is this. Some people struggle with that. Well, well how much do I give and what do I give? I, I think if you'll settle the second part of the equation instead of the first part, the first part will settle itself. And it's this, that God owns the other 90%. He owns the rest of it. I come up with whatever percentage I want to come up with. I'll give him 8%. I'll give him 10%. I'll give him, you know, and churches are doing, let me tell you something. And I, I've watched churches are doing all kinds of things to try to get people to give because people don't give to the church anymore. They, they, there's a program, a church if I know, they say, okay, we want to just get you started if you'll give 1% or 2%. And then we'll graduate you to 3% and 4%. And then we'll get you up here to this and then to that. And, and, and it's a whole program to try to... Um, Somehow, some way, get people to surrender to the fact that God owns it all. And I, 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 let me just tell you, as a young person, as a teenager, when I turned 16, I got a job at a drugstore. And I began to make money. And when I got that money, you know what I did with it? I hoarded every bit of it. I'm telling you, it was a joke. I said, you, long pockets. You ever heard what that, you know what long, anybody know what a long pocket is? Come on now. Nobody's ever heard that. Some people are long pockets. So you, you, your pocket goes down here so far, you put the money in it, you can never reach it. That's what you say. Mark, you're a long pocket. Boy, you got that money in there? You're never going to get it out. 
you're right, I'm hoarding that stuff. i got a plan for it. See, the money was more important than the fact that, that God owned it all. And I'm going to tell you, you know, I was making, oh, I don't know, what was it back in the day? $3.25 was minimum wage or something like that? Is that right? Am I thinking about that right? But three twenty-five. dollars Man, I got up to three thirty-five, three fifty. I thought I was doing something, right? And God said, "Mark, you're, Mark, you're making three twenty-five. Boy, you're really getting it done, aren't you? You gonna hold on to that?" I said, "You know what, Lord, I am." God said, "I'm gonna convict you," and He did. And I came to a point in my life where I just had to die, die to making money die to the power that money would bring. And and Michelle, I'll tell you, I came to a point, I just said, no, not going to do it. And I didn't make that my goal. I didn't make that my drive. And and I'm going to tell you, I had that drive as a young person. I had that drive. I had that desire. God got a hold of me and said, Mark, I own 100% of it. Will you be willing to give me back every bit of it? And that's where one of the surrenders of my life came, where it wasn't just about the money. It was about where I would live, what I would do, what job I would pursue, where I would go, who I would make my friends. See, it was a holistic understanding of surrender that brought me to the ability to let go of the managing of all the money I had dumped in my pocket all the way down to my ankle. Long pockets. You know what long pockets became for me? Empty pockets because I gave it all to God. I did. And it set me free. And everything that I've given, I've thought about this. If I went back and I calculated from the time that I surrendered to today how much I've ever given to the Lord in, quote, financial numbers, would I want it back? It would be a significant amount to me for my little ability to understand what money is. Would I want it back? What would I do with it? Would I put a pool in my backyard? Would I buy a sports car? Would I buy a beach house? Would I travel around the world? What would I do with it? I'm going to tell you what I'd do with it. I would do nothing with it in comparison to what I understand it has done for eternity and what it's done for me and surrender to the Lord and trusting everything to Him. If I had not surrendered it, I would have been a narcissistic, self-focused, type A, personality-driven person that would, would have lived for himself. That's what I would have been. That's what it would have gotten me. Where, I don't know where I would be, what I would be doing, but I would not be trusting it to God. And I am so at peace with every penny I've ever given to God because I just, I just it's going to be His and He's done with it what He wants and, and, I, and I feel so at peace about that. And what I would have, how I would have managed it would have been all about me. And so what good is that? There's no good in it. And so... My, my first point here is this whole deal is I had to grapple with the fact that he owns the 90% as well as the 10% and literally the 100%. He owns it all. The second thing that really helped me was um, is that my giving became prayer-based and, and it resulted in obedient and joyful heart. It wasn't a, it wasn't a force manipulated because somebody stood up in a church service or a, or a conference somewhere and manipulated me to give, and then I gave for a second, and I felt better about that, then I went back to just living. No, I, I found that the key to my giving was in prayer on my knees and surrender, that then coming out of that, I was able to give a beautiful offering willingly without anybody else knowing as unto the Lord. And see, prayer brings the willingness and the obedience and a joyful heart in wanting to give. And then I learned that as I gave, my family and my children saw the joy in the giving and they learned that it was connected to my obedience to God. Uh, And so I began to, not even realizing it, model among my children and in my family that I'm good with that. And it's because... I don't give to impress people. I don't give to whatever. I give out of obedience to the Lord, not just in that area of my life, but every area. Obedience, Mark, go talk to that person about Christ. Obedience, Mark, go through this hard thing um, as you serve me in the church. Obedience, Mark, go do this. Obe- whatever it is, it's, a, it's about a bigger, holistic picture of obedience to Christ. And that's... A powerful and beautiful thing to be able to share with those that know you best. 
And then when our children see our joyful giving, they learn the importance of this, investing in things eternal. If you'll look in verse 17, Paul said these words. He said, credited to your account. What kind of account is he talking about? Is he talking about a bank account that he was keeping? Was he keeping the money box like Judas was? And he was tallying, tallying up who gave what and all that? No, not at all. What he's talking about is the fact that we're going to give an account to God one day. So he said it was credited to his account. I had a church member stop me. I think it was last Wednesday in the hallway. They said, I've been reading a book. And they've been talking about the fact that we're going to give an account one day and the Lord's got a record and he's going to talk to us. And he said, what was said in the book was simply this, that we're going to give an account for the opportunities that we missed. And he said, that scares me to death. I don't want that. I want to be obedient to everything God calls me to. So I've been meditating on that comment that was made to me. And I said, how does that fit into giving? Every opportunity God has given me, like, have I been obedient to that? And see, you say, well, you're just trying to get me to give more financially. I don't have to do that at all. Because all I need you to do is surrender to the Lord. And if you're surrendered to the Lord, He will lead you and He will guide you in every area of your life and giving. Both the going and the giving of your resources, your life, your gift, the whole deal. And then when we are living that way, which the world cannot understand. The world says you live for yourself. You don't give of yourself. You live for yourself. But when we live uh, not for ourselves, the Bible says to die to yourself, take up your cross and follow me. We become the conduit for God to flow through us, then all that we say and do is an eternal investment for the kingdom of God that God keeps a record of. And it's a beautiful thing. And there won't be missed opportunities. Ecclesiastes 5.15 says, Solomon wrote, he said, Naked a man comes from his mother's womb, and as he comes, so he departs. He takes nothing from his labor that he can carry in his hand He toils for the wind. (sighs) I can't tell you how many people I've known in my life who have amassed a lot of things, and when they die, they leave every bit of them behind. And it's going to be true for me, and it's going to be true for you. I want to store up things in heaven that are credited to my account out of obedience to Christ. Matthew 6, 19 through 21 says, Do not. Store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Do you think that's true? It is. Jesus said it. He also said in the Sermon on the Mount, You can't serve both God and money. He also said on the Sermon sermon on the Mount, he was trying to get the people to understand. He said, listen, if I feed the birds, I'll feed you. He also said, listen, he said so much about don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about what you wear and what you eat. Pagans run after all those kinds of things. I'm going to meet your every need. And so on and on it goes. If you'll just study the Sermon on the Mountain, the Beatitudes and all of that, and you come to the end, and he simply says this, if you were just to take out the things that deal with finances and our needs and the things that we need and money, just out of that, I was reading it the other day, you come to the conclusion, uh, God's got me. God's going to take care of me. And at the very end of it, he says, listen, If you will take these words, this Sermon on the Mount, these things I've just said, and if you will put them into practice, put them into practice, what it says at the very end of it. He said, then you'll be like a wise man who built his house on the rock, and when the storm comes, you will not fall. But too often when it comes to finances and money and our needs and what we want and all of those things, we don't trust God. We do it our way, and we're building on the sand, and the storm comes, and and it wipes us out, and we go, man. I should have known this stuff wasn't going to last. Well, isn't that what Jesus said? It's true. What everything he says is true. And I am convinced without a doubt there's a direct connection between our finances and our willingness to spread the gospel through the local church. Without a doubt, it's there. May I say to you that this church, they were a sharing church. 
But I also don't want us to miss that they were ascending church. Look at verses 18. Look at verse 18. He said, I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied now that I receive from Epaphroditus the gift you sent. Ascending church, not a stagnant church. They were willing to give of their people, their best people, their good people, their willing people, their gifted people. The ones that would go and suffer and be with Paul while he was in prison. Go to a place uh, that, you know, it, it wasn't like this is going to be a vacation. This was, a, this was ministry and it was spiritual. And they sent Epaphroditus with the gift. But they sent one that they loved. They renewed their concern through Epaphroditus when they learned of the need. They responded Not because Paul was begging. He was not. The gift came. And there was a goer. There was the financial gift that was given. But there was the goer who was Epaphroditus. We we talked all about him in Philippians 2, 25 through 30. And this was a recurring, rejoicing gift. And he he says, with great rejoicing. Do you see how Paul was blessed by the, the financial gift and the fact that Epaphroditus sent it, the partnership, the, the personal relationship, the church functioning, it was, it was brought about great rejoicing for him. I promise you Paul did not go, hey man, give me that envelope. I want to count what's in there. And let me see how much they gave. Oh, they're a few dollars short. Epaphroditus, go back and give me something else. And that, that's not it. You're missing it. The gift is helpful, yes. It helped meet his needs. It helped spread the gospel. Epaphroditus coming, the willingness to come be a part of what he was doing was beautiful. It was encouraging. It was was partnership. It was the church. He's no longer by himself. Those in Philippi have been praying for him, sending to him, giving to him. We're doing this together, and the gospel is spreading. It was beautiful when we get involved in this way. I thought about This summer, we are going to be asking you to participate in uh, going and being a part of a family mission trip to Kentucky. And I'm here to tell you, when we ask you to pray about that and participate in that, we're going to ask you to give in every way. We're going to ask you to give of your time. We're going to ask you to uh, drive your car. You know what that means? you got to fill it up probably at that time with five and six dollar gallon worth of gas. Very likely. What is it, four something now? I saw it yesterday up around $5. <laughs> so that takes some sacrifice to fill your tank up and go. I'm going to ask you to take time out of your week. I'm going to ask you to bring your family along. Those who are small and those who are teenagers, some, are, some of the teenagers are going to say, oh, I don't want to go do that. Let's take them anyway. And some are going to say, hey, uh, they're too little to go. Let's bring them anyway. We'll help each other. We'll get through it. But let's go. Let's go to an area that needs us. Let's go and let's give of our time. Let's give of our money. Let's give of our skill. Let's go and serve in the Lord's cafe. Let's go put roofs on houses. Let's go serve people. Why? Because we get the privilege of partnering in the spreading of the gospel. That's why we do that. We could do a ministry to, um, I don't know, I would like one to the Caribbean. Let's do a church Camp to the Caribbean. Hey, that sounds kind of good, right? I'll pick the perfect place as the pastor. I'll get the clearest water, the whitest sand. And uh, we'll all just sit around and pray all day. What do y'all think? Y'all all want to sign up and let's go? I mean, there's nothing wrong with going to the Caribbean. I love going to the Caribbean. And there's nothing wrong with getting away and being refreshed if God leads us to do those kind of things. But that's not where we put our emphasis if we're going to spread the gospel. It's not about us. It's about where God leads us and who we send, how we give, what we do to, listen, be a gospel-spreading, supporting church. That's what it's about. Gospel-driven. I am convinced that is the key. And we are living in an era where people are raising money for all kinds and types of things in the name of God and in ministry, for ministry's sake, that are not, listen to me, gospel driven. And we've got to be wise about it. 
We got to make sure we are gospel driven in everything that we do. We may not feel compelled to go, and I'm not saying everybody's going to go to Kentucky. We want those to go that feel led to go. But for sure, every member ought to be compelled to God's work through the local church because it is the local church that feeds. It is the local church spiritually that develops. It is the local church that we have our connections in, that we encourage one another. It is the local church. Listen, why do you support the local church? Why do you give financially to the local church? It's God's structure. It's God's bride. And it's the, the church has been given the commission, the mission to make disciples until he comes. But the local church is, listen, the local church is in competition with parachurch ministries all around the world. We're in competition with all kinds of things. The hearts of the people. That's what everyone's after. And they want to convince you. And I'm not saying that parachurch ministries are wrong. I give to those. And you may as well. But I've learned that the number one place I'm going to give is to the local church that God has called me to be a part of because I have studied enough in Scripture to be convinced of this one thing. It is His bride. He's put a structure in place. Um, every part of the body matters. The eye, the nose, the ear, the hand, the foot, the whole deal. Every person matters. And as we are unified together, both in the giving, the sending, the going, the supporting, the whole deal of how it works, it's God's way, and that's what must be supported. Um, I'm just convinced of that. That's why the Curtis Corps, we, we want to help people find God, follow Jesus, invest in others, and impact the world. You know one of the things I've always appreciated about Billy Graham's ministry, he's gone on to be with the Lord now, is that he always said this, and I've heard it many times. He said, first give to your church, then give to the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. First serve in your church, then come serve with us. And he never superseded, undercut the local church. In fact, he depended on the local church for any of his crusades to be a success. He would go to the local church and say, would you partner with me? Will you pray with me? Will you participate with me? Uh, will you be faithful? And he knew that God's way was the local church first. And I believe that with all my heart. And when that's the case, thirdly, we are willing to be a sacrificing church. Look at 18. I just love this last part here. He said, they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. Three things there. Fragrant offering, acceptable sacrifice, and the two together equal if fragrant offering plus acceptable sacrifice equals, this is a math equation, pleasing to God. We've got to understand what this is. They were a sacrificing church. They weren't a play it safe church. Um, what makes a gift an offering? It's a great question. I, I think the key is it has to be fragrant. Well, what makes a fragrant offering? I think what makes a fragrant offering is the fact that it comes from a willing heart. It's not coerced. It's not manipulated. It's willing to do so. Once a year, usually around this time of the year, Michelle and I get together. I want y'all to know this is a lie. I'm going to tell you this. This is a lie. We get together, and, and I'm making this up. We get together, and I say, honey, I can't wait. She says, oh, I can't wait either. We can't wait to pay our taxes. <laughs> what? How many of y'all do that? Huh? Come on now. Y'all, I got to fix this before I kill myself. Okay. Um, how many of y'all do that? Come on. I mean, we pay. We, we give to God what is God and to Caesar what is Caesar. We do that of obedience. But we don't get together and celebrate that we're going to give uh, to the IRS. Right? If we did, you may think there's something wrong with us. But I don't know. Listen, my point is this. When we give to God, shouldn't there be a, a celebration? Shouldn't there be an excitement? Shouldn't there be a willingness to give because it is a fragrant offering that comes from a willing heart? I mean, I'm getting to the heart of the matter here. It's a willingness. It's not a prying out. It's not a manipulation. It's a willingness. And what makes a gift acceptable? That's the second great question. Is this? It has to be sacrificial. This is super interesting because sacrificial also is connected to willingness. 
I read this article, and I thought it was a, very interesting to me. And the title of the article this week was, A Former Canadian Soldier Known as the World's Deadliest Sniper Arrived in Ukraine to Help the Nation Defend Itself from Russia. Any of y'all see this story? Super interesting. This particular individual said, I want to help them. I have to help them. It's as simple as that, the Canadian man said. He's only identified as Wally to protect his family's safety. I have to help them because they are people here being bombarded just because they want to be European and not Russian. He said when he got there, the people were so happy to have him. They greeted us. They hugged us. They were so thankful that we showed up. They were our friends right away. Wally, which is not his name, but what he goes by, he's 40 years old. He has a young family and works as a civil computer programmer. The article talked about that he is the world's, known as the world's greatest um, uh, sniper because he has accomplished multiple times a shot over two miles. Amazing. And hitting his target. Now you would think, he's up there in Canada. He's got a job. He's got a family. Everything's good. Why go over to a conflict and put your life in danger when you're not required to? You don't have to. He sacrificed. He put his life there. They asked him about this sacrifice, and he said this. He said, the hardest part of making the decision to join the war was missing my son's first birthday. I would say there's some sacrifice. There's some sacrifice. Huh. Now, our, our gifts are, are to be sacrificial. It, it means we give God our best and, and we do it with a willing heart, even maybe when it's hard or, or it's dangerous or it's beyond us. We give anyway. Just take the time. I, I, I know I'm out of time, but listen, go and read Malachi 1, 6 through 14. And what you're going to find there, just take the time to read it. What you're going to find there is that the priest had got into the habit of bringing God uh, damaged goods. They bring a, a lamb with a broken leg, or they bring less of them bringing their best. And they're trying to bring this sacrifice to the Lord. And they're trying to act all spiritual. And they're bringing it. And they're trying to go through the motions. And God knows all along, man, you're bringing me junk. I, I'm God. I'm great. I deserve better than this. Others wouldn't even accept this. But you bring this to me? And I think he has, I think he has a legitimate concern. And so you see, people go and they read the one we read earlier, later in Malachi. But you've got to go back and you've got to read the first part. Because you get to the heart of the matter. It's not just about stealing from God and you didn't bring. Yes, they did. They stole. But the problem was, was in their heart because they wanted to rip God off by appearing spiritual and bringing their junk. That's, that's the truth of the matter in layman's terms. But go read it. Malachi 1, 6 through 14. I know a man who says, listen, you need to have some skin in the game if you're going to be a part of this. <laughs> I think what is, we're called to be living sacrifices, Romans 12, 1 and 2, right? We are to give sacrificially of our lives in every way. What does it mean to give a sacrifice? I tried to think about that, you know, it's to give God our best. Have you ever done this? Probably not, but I'm going to tell you something very personal that I've done before, and I hope you don't judge me for it. But there's been several times in the kitchen that I've watched individuals in my family prepare food and get a paper plate out of the cabinet and put their food on it. It wouldn't be messy like something like an egg and an egg yolk, not, not that far, but maybe like just a piece of toast, right? And they get the plate down, they eat their toast in about two seconds, and, and the plate's not damaged at all, but they take the plate and they put it in the trash. And I'm thinking to myself, that plate is not damaged. I can save that plate. Yeah. And I'm being honest. I'll go over when nobody is watching I'll just kind of stand there, and I put my foot on a little thing down here. Whoop, the thing goes up. I go, hmm, I'll take that off to there. And I'll get that plate, five-second rule. You got to do it within five seconds. <laughs> get the plate out of the trash. <laughs> That's the best part. You go over to the cabinet, and you just put it back in. <laughs> I love it. 
And then, and then they come back the next morning. They get that plate out, make that toast, put it on there. Woo, go put it. And we do it again. <laughs> do you know how much money I have saved by recycling plates out of the trash can? Listen, that's not every day. It has ha- have to admit it's happened a couple of times. But I want you to imagine that. And that is, tr- that is a true story. But imagine this. You come over to my house. Yeah, buddy. You want a little something to eat? You think I ought to get that paper plate out of the cabinet for you? Somebody up here is going, no, no, don't do that. But you know what? I've got a nice plate, you know, China plate over here. I got this paper plate that came out of the trash can. I think I'm going to give you the paper plate, man. Yeah, that's giving you trash. You know how many times we've given God the paper plate? Just think about it. When we have the ability to give whatever, the, I, I go read, just go read Malachi 1, 6 and following. And, and God's simply saying, I'm God. Give me the best. I gave you the best. I gave you my son. Just listen to this if you would. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Be imitators of God, therefore. Imitators of God. Imitators of God, therefore. As dearly and loved children and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The exact same words. Fragrant offering sacrifice to God, Jesus died for us. We receive it. We are saved. We are headed to heaven. We have access to the throne of God through Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit in us. And we come and we say, God, nah, I ain't going to support your local church. I'm giving you a paper plate. I'm not supporting the gospel going forward because I think I can manage it better than you can. And I'm not, I, I, I'm just telling you, With all of my heart, I have no problem asking God's people to give the very best to Almighty God in the proclamation and the spreading of the gospel because that's what we've been called to. That's what saved us, and that's what we have to be about. Mm. You say, why do I struggle so much in the area of giving? And all of us can I get it. I've been there. I know. But I think for me it comes down to verse 19 and 20. In closing, I want to read this. He says, And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. It's the first part here. That God will meet all... I have to ask myself. Will God meet all my needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus? I find when I don't give God the best and I want to manage it, I don't really believe that. I don't believe he is capable of meeting my every need through the riches of Christ Jesus. When you, when you dial this all back and you dissect it and you, and you do everything to it, what you realize is what Paul said earlier. I can do all things through Christ who, give me, who gives me strength because he had an contentment about him that was learned that God would meet his every need. Whether he had a lot or a little, the whole deal. It was about full surrender and contentment that allows him to close out with the confidence to say that God will meet all our needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And when that's settled, the rest of that things that we are going to give an account for, that we're responsible for, we're able to come like this and say, it's all yours, 100% God. In prayer, in your presence, I will obey your leading with it all. And that's the difference maker. It was all shared partnership. Paul was willing to go to God for his contentment. Epaphroditus was willing to go for God in delivering the needed gift and being the gift. The Philippians were willing to give God by letting Epaphroditus go and by giving of the gift financially. And it was all in this ministry cycle of the church functioning. 
Hudson Taylor said, when God's work is done in God's way for God's glory, it will not lack God's supply. I believe it to be true. They were a gospel-engaged church in that they were a sharing church, a sending church, and a sacrificing church. I close with this report. NBC News reported this week, Americans are besieged by stress. Their concerns over nuclear war and inflation following two years of a pandemic have Americans more stressed than ever. Financial woes coupled with a barrage of horrifying scenes from Ukraine as Russia continues its invasion has pushed a majority of Americans to unprecedented levels of stress, according to the new report. It's off the charts. According to their results, 87% of those surveyed cited rising cost of everyday items such as groceries and gas as significant sources of stress. The same high percentage said that their mental health was greatly affected by what they felt as a constant stream of crisis without a break over the last two years. And 84% said the Russian invasion of Ukraine is terrifying to watch. That was survey number one. Survey number two, in order to get the most accurate picture of stress in America, the researchers set out to do a second poll with questions specific to Russia and Ukraine. 80% of respondents said they were concerned about potential retia retaliation from Russia, either through cyber attacks or nuclear threats. And 69% they said that they feared they were witnessing the beginning stages of what could be World War III. Beyond pinpointing the source of stress for Americans, the poll also um, delved into how the stress impacted their physical health. Nearly a quarter of the respondents said they tried to cope with pandemic stress by drinking more alcohol, and 58% had undesired weight fluctuations, either gaining or losing more weight than they wanted. You say, why are you closing with that? Because I think it's a realistic picture of the world we live in. Will things get better? Will they get worse? I don't know. But here's what I do know. It's the indicators are this, is that people, after two years of a pandemic, the possibility of war that could lead to World War III, and that's not just hyperbole, I promise you. There's some realistic stuff going on right around us today. It may be leading your neighbor, your coworker, your family, your friends, finally, to a breaking point. If the breaking point comes, the only thing that will fill them is the truth of Jesus Christ and that He is Savior. There's nothing else that brings the hope. And the great uh, just hope that is in my heart is that the church is going to be renewed in being a gospel-driven church that meets a society in brokenness and Revival comes in the church that leads to great awakening like we can never imagine. I'll be honest with you, I thought that COVID and the pandemic would have brought more brokenness, but I didn't really see that. Will it be two years of COVID, financial crisis, possibility of war that brings us to a breaking point where we're no longer depending on ourselves, but that we will look to God. And when that looking happens, the church must be ready. And the only way we're going to be ready is if we are committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ, holistically surrendered in every way, prepared, looking for, anticipating that that's why God has left us here, to be salt and to be light. And it's directly connected to holistic giving to God in every area of our life. I pray that we'll be prepared. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.